Greetings, everybody. This is, uh, we're just about winter in Mississippi. I'm making a video to talk about fertilization. And, um, before that, I want to show you this, uh, this fig tree. Now, you would not guess this, but this fig tree was planted at the beginning of the season. And it's about six foot tall. And it was just a, one branch at the bottom that basically, it was a small plant, a small tree that I um, put in here. And it was, and it practically died, but at the base, one bud was left and that bud produced this now this here I've got about at least a foot or more than that I had like two feet of wood chips and um, I dug around here a little bit when I was putting strawberries okay I put my strawberries I transplanted them here now they're gonna thrive in this whoo and so when I was digging, what I saw is that the roots of this here are everywhere inside of the wood chips, at, like, at the bottom part of the wood chips. And look at this. I mean, all the other ones are, are relatively small. Like, I mean, they're like one, one year old, maybe two, three feet high. But th like the power of wood chips, whoo. All right. but. Um, yeah, I'm making this video because I've been hearing a lot and reading a lot of comments on the uh, internet about fertilization and how and how you need to fertilize in order to have significant crops. And you even have the the experts telling you that the university experts or the farmer experts like the uh, salatins and all those gurus saying that you need either and then they make this um this false dichotomy of either you need animal manure or climate change ridden chemicals from oil industry and uh, then there's a big fight about who's right who's wrong but the fact of the matter is most of this information that comes from these people they um, they are just doing one thing and they've been always doing that one thing and they've never actually tried to not put fertilizer because of course it's not going to work so they don't try it and then they're experts at what they're doing but folks you could grow crops without fertilizer without uh, chemical fertilizers or without animal fertilizers and not only at a small scale but at a large scale now, I cannot testify at a very, very large scale because I'm doing small, um, but what I'm doing here can be scaled up and has been scaled up by people in France and people in uh, the third world countries that were... Um, basically applying Dr. Lemieux, Gilles Lemieux's uh, research findings regarding soil aggradation. Um, yeah, this year what we're looking at is the, uh, the fall garden as we head into winter. And sorry, I'm just like, yeah, huh, but I, uh, 
I never, uh, when this quote, uh, season is over for a certain plant, I never really rip them out of the ground or anything like that. I usually just cut at the base and leave the roots inside. But look at this here. This grew all over again and we're heading into winter. <laughs> and I learned this little here, this is collard greens, okay? This little plant has taught me a lot of things. You see, there's a little, you can't see this probably, but I mean, there's a little stub here on the bottom. That's where I cut this plant uh, two seasons ago. I mean, almost two years ago. And it didn't die, and it produced a shoot from the, from the side here. And then it produced collard greens. And then I cut that down, and then it did it again this year. So this collard green, is acting as a perennial. It doesn't matter if it freezes or anything like that. It it, it just sprouts back from that shoot, from that little bud there, the the stump there. And uh, you you would not like you, you can't read about this stuff because people buy seeds every year and they start their collard greens all over again every year. But that's because when the plant is exhausted, they um, they take the plant, whatever is left, and they pull it out, right? They tear it out of the ground, and then they they uh, do whatever to their soil, and then they start again. But because I wanted to try something different and not ever tear anything out, even like the supposedly quote weeds, I don't I don't pull them out. I just cut them, and it doesn't matter if they sprout back. Uh, the roots that they produce in the ground, um, when I cut them, the roots uh, decompose and are being eaten, and then they they provide organic matter inside the bed. So I'm actually I look forward to having like this, like for example, this here, and I don't remember its name. I researched it a while back. Uh, if I pulled it out, of course it wouldn't come back, but if I cut it, it comes back. But the thing is, it's providing a lot of roots here and organic matter. And actually this here, uh, this quote weed, is actually uh, um, in China is used for cancer, you know. And this is like they study this in universities and research institutes and they package this as a tea and they're doing all sorts of other uh, pharmaceutical products with it but they, as a tea they sell it and 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 here we don't talk about this but in China they uh, I mean it's like very well known that it helps you know um, curb uh, cancer the um, uh, symptoms of cancer but anyways, here it's just a vulgar weed, you know, and this is what most weeds are like, you know, uh, chickweed, right? This is food, we leave it here. This is a turnip, look at this big, nice purple top turnip green. I don't know if you could see it. Um, so anyways, the, back to the fertilizer. Oh wait, same thing with this uh, eggplant. You know, it was pretty much dead after the summer, at the end of the summer, and now it's it's back again. It has this, all of these uh, jalapenos here, they volunteered from uh, jalapenos that fell on the, see like this here. I, I let the plants um, reproduce by themselves as much as I can. It's a, uh, it's part of uh, the the uh, precepts of sacred agriculture. I'm not going to get into that right now, but so yeah. Uh, the thing is, with uh, soil aggradation differs from fertilization in that when you fertilize what you're doing is you're amending the soil with or organic or chemical input and like when you bring compost into your garden composted manure 
liquid manure, or chemicals. You're adding, okay? That's an amendment. This here is going to be the, quote, food for your plants for the, um, for the growing season. These are heirloom uh, turnips. They're uh, dark brown. They're absolutely delicious. And every year you have to start again. You have to amend again. And every year you need to amend. That's your basic fertilization. Soil aggradation is actually the process of building soil, not amending soil. Again, if you, the so-called experts will tell you that um, it takes thousands of years to produce a few uh, inches of soil, you read this stuff on the on the World Health Organization, the expert professors in their departments of bullshit, of university bull, of bullshit. <laughs> um, no, I, sh I, I shouldn't say that because there, there are some that are waking up to the fact that um, most of the information in universities has been fed by, uh, by the propaganda and the lobby of the uh, big ag fertilizer corporations. They're just repeating the research that is convenient for a faulty paradigm. Um, so then, um, look at this one. Isn't it? It is getting really big. Yummy, yum, yum. You could um, ferment these. You cut them into like, like uh, little cubes or like French fries, and you you uh, you put them in brine, salt water, and you let them on your counter for like two, three uh, weeks, and. They pickle, like for, they wild ferment, and uh, mm, they're so delicious, it's unbelievable. So, um, so yeah, there is. You don't have to wait hundreds and thousands of years to get soil. The soil process is called soil aggradation, and the quickest way is to look at what happens in the forest. You see. Most of the soils in uh, most of the soils we grow our food on was it came from the forest ecosystem where people had cleared the forest and then they um, they grow food and then there's they after a while they have to amend with a fertilizer um, or it's river banks you know um, dried up river banks where there's a lot of fertile soil, but after a while, it's not fertile anymore. You're not producing soil. But the forest produces soil uh, by, um, by um, breaking down the small branches. Okay, let's go look at some small branches here. Okay, like these here, branches. Some trees, they lose a lot of their branches and the leaves and everything. And inside of these branches, okay, is a different type of, of lignin than in the big tree trunk. And it, and it has um, different, um, different enzymes, different plant juices. It's much more, quote, um, alive, one might say. And it's all these branches that fall on the ground that basically are being uh, eaten by fungi. And it's when the fungi break down these, uh, the lignin, the um, cellulose, hemicellulose, whatever, like it doesn't matter what the uh, what the scientific name of is when the uh, fungi break down the 
the wood of the small branches that soil is created really quickly okay um, that is soil aggradation so you so all these wood chips what they are is basically is um, chipped small branches and what it does is it just the surface it creates a, a, a much uh, greater surface for the fungi to start to um, to break down the uh, the wood and create soil mm. now this here so I'm not going to get in all the details you could look at Dr. Gilles Lemieux Ramiel chipped wood and you'll see um, there's a lot of studies that have been done on large-scale farming where they put in maybe two inches uh, thick of these uh, of this ramule wood ramule just means small branch okay and then uh, they um, they till that in and then for the next five years the fungi start breaking down and making soil it builds soil you don't need any fertilizer manure you don't need chemicals nothing and you could grow any crop look at these uh, heirloom uh, uh, turnips yum yum a lot of turnip greens wow <laughs> here's the um, here are the uh, strawberries that I've, uh, I'm transplanting down there. See, they're happy here, but they just can't grow on, these are like raised beds. They can't grow sideways, right? So, and um, they'll be happier down there. See, what I did is when the mother, this was one plant at the beginning of the season. Let me just back up. And it kept producing, like, I think they call them stolons or... And then I would basically guide them into pots. Now I cut, you could cut the uh, the link and you got yourself the one you could transplant. See, look, this is one here that's trying to grow outward. outward. You just put a pot and put this in the soil and it'll grow roots. Um, yeah, uh, okay before I continue look at this wonderful um, plant here this is like bok choy I tried just for fun uh, I'm gonna let it go to seed cuz cuz um, I only have two or three of these around and they're heirloom so hopefully it'll make it to seed winter's coming uh, the frost uh, the freeze is coming they might not make it uh, okay, back to soil aggradation. So, uh, now, so there is no absolute, like, mandatory need to put in animal uh, manure, <laughs> animal products to have to grow food on a large scale. From the research, from what the research has shown to small scale obviously that uh, that I've been proving uh, myself but you do need soil aggradation or else there are m much of what we call food will not grow and produce what quote we call food and so why do I insist on this here um, what we call food is basically hybridized or genetically selected highly unnatural plant species 99% of what we call food is fake like cucumbers like what we have what we call cucumbers are not really uh, don't really resemble the origin like the uh, the wild cucumber like just the same with carrots the wild carrots they don't they don't resemble what we call carrots and it's and I there's how do they call that um, artificial selection okay Rev versus natural selection see what what nature does creation creates naturally uh, a whole wide like diversity of plants 
what we have as food has all comes from an ancestor from nature but has been worked on now people get all worked up about Monsanto when they work directly inside the genetics but you could work externally by crossing by um, they used to do all sorts of stuff and back then they used to put seeds and plants and uh, put them under uh, UV lights and see what kind of defects would be created they would take those defects cross them with something else then you know you end up to, you end up with a plant that grows super super big whatever <laughs> big uh, big fruits big uh, big leaves big roots but uh, they're like Franken foods that need this artificial fertilizer. Okay? If we were to go back to food, to like wild edibles, they would grow perfectly fine with nothing but what creation offers. Just, just wherever it grows, that would be perfectly fine. No water, no nothing. But we want these tomatoes, we want these eggplants, we want these huge, huge tomatoes that have nothing to do with anything natural. And yet, when we put this cow manure, fertilized cow manure, we call it organic, natural. There's nothing natural in it. Let's, let's be honest. Okay, this is, being honest, it seems to be a very difficult thing for most uh, growers out there. It's like there's a spiritual narcissism going on where uh, people want to, to uh, others to think how, how good they are, how amazing, amazingly you know, spiritual they are, but they have no clue. Their food is artificial, their fertilizer is artificial, and they uh, all call this healing the planet or uh, yeah, like like you see so many people like say we are healing the healing the planet with because we are doing organic sustainable, and you when you dig into their practices, there's absolutely nothing sustainable about it. And I don't want to pick on people, specific people, but mo like pretty much most people doing organic or biodynamic agriculture is not sustainable and they um they'll repeat that it is you know but um you can't you can't have enough cow manure and the cows uh whatever manure is produced from them certainly like in, in most instances is it or the chicken manure isn't very organic most cows have to be vaccinated in the united states you know and whatever food they have whatever they're doing whatever compost or they're they're using what all whatever they are there's somewhere in the link uh imports are coming in the farm from from outside and and anyways um i don't like i could make a video on why there's so much lying out there so much hypocrisy here's like where i grew uh the okra and you see here this basically this is the soil that I've got right now. This here is um, was very was sand pretty much when I started this process, and now it's slow. It's slowly getting darker and darker. And this is just the fungi that are decomposing the wood chips. Okay, it's not fer fertilizer. Well, one could say maybe you know we could play with words here for a long time. Um, but it's basically building soil and so this here you don't have like for the next five years I don't need to do anything maybe even more than that because I'm not in a hurry okra my okra doesn't grow really big <laughs> doesn't get very tall but uh, it produces enough okra for us and when everybody else's okra is ready mine is not nearly close to being ready but it gets there <laughs> Maybe it gets there three weeks late. I, I don't care. I still have lots of okra. Um, so what else did I want to talk about here? I want to say something here really quickly about um, 
this notion of how traits are passed on, uh, genetic traits are passed on from mother to uh, the um, offsprings in the plant and kingdom. We are told that it's a very complex process and that uh, you can't really in one generation or two generations think that you could um, have significant impact by just growing plants in different environments and that some traits will express themselves as uh, selective traits but uh, that it takes a uh, a whole, a whole uh, slew of processes and that's why they do the, the genetic modifications. Uh, they shoot genes inside of the, the cells. Anyways, there's this guy in France that he grows tomatoes in a uh, region that is uh, very arid and the soil is very sandy and rocky. And he got some heirloom seeds and he put them out there and basically they didn't produce much because these seeds, the genetics came from um, from seed farms where they they took it from plants that were pampered. You see, the um, people grow tomatoes with a lot of fertilizers because they say it's a heavy feeder. So uh, the seeds that are produced um, come from a parent that has been pampered okay there's lots of water lots of nitrogen lots of everything super big plants with uh, then the produce seeds these seeds go to the public who then have to do the same thing in order for the phenotype, phenotypes uh, of the genes to express themselves so they have big tomatoes and big plants now this guy put his seeds out there and he did nothing uh, he watered them or he started them uh, in pots, then he transplanted them in the field, and he watered them once. And then almost all of the plants died <laughs> because they weren't pampered like their uh, mother was pampered. But the ones that survived made small little tomatoes, and he kept those seeds. And then he did it again. And then by the third time round, pretty much all of his plants were surviving and were producing tomatoes. Now he's 10 years into this process and he's got amazing tomatoes growing everywhere and he never waters. Um, only at the beginning, to be, like when you plant the, your seedlings and if he, you know, because uh, you, have to, you have to get the soil to adhere to the small little roots or else they're going to dry out and you're finished. Um, I think he watered once if uh, it gets really, really, really dry because it doesn't rain that much. Sometimes it doesn't rain at all for five months. And so he has to put a bit of water uh, because the uh, there's some spider, um, small little spiders that suck the uh, plant sap you know, from the leaves and then the plant is losing whatever water it's holding on to, he has to supplement but this is just to say if you stop buying seeds and you produce your own seeds and you don't pamper your plants okay uh, then you will get some genetics going that will be able to grow in whatever conditions you are at and this is not something that like if this is not something science will will agree with but this is something that actually works so um, there's something to be said about uh, pampering your plants with uh, fertilizer and water that is actually not serving your best interests in the long run, okay? Unless you really want to be buying seeds every year and you want to be buying fertilizer and you want to be spending all this money watering, then go ahead. But if your goal is to come closer uh, and go back into the arms of creation, you want to let creation do what it does to uh, the offsprings and do what it does to the seeds and do what it does to your quote artificial genetics 
um, eventually like one of the things I'm going towards in sacred agriculture is getting seeds of wild edibles and then starting back the process to create something that I will be able to uh, garden and and uh, that is really close to the uh, the natural g genetics um, that creation decided upon so like for example this here is uh, mustard greens I've got two kinds of mustard greens here they're both heirloom but heirloom don't be tricked heirloom is still artificial genetics okay uh, unless you're dealing with like Jerusalem artichokes or something like that it's like um, must these this mustard green the kale the collard greens the uh, Swiss chard all of them are uh, genetic genetically enhanced species that all come from one ancestor which is the uh, wild uh, mustard green. The wild mustard green grows everywhere around here. I um, collected thousands of seeds and I put them um, in a, a spot in here in the garden and then I will be getting those seeds and then I will be eating pretty much only those mustard greens and uh, I might try um, crossing them with the heirlooms to see if I could if they could like um, change the taste a little bit, but maybe not, you know. Uh, the goal is to go back into the arms of creation. So there you have it. That was a little special here on um, what you can do by saving your seeds, okay? Don't be fooled what people say. Just do it yourself and then let all the scientists be amazed, okay? Because this is what's happening in France. All the professors from the universities are going to see you, this guy, and they're like, what? That's not possible. Uh, the environment can't have that much of an influence on the uh, traits of the seeds and the, and the offsprings, And but they're like, huh, these plants don't need water. These tomatoes don't need nitrogen. How is that possible? Okay, so there you go. You can amaze the scientists around you, only the ones that are open enough. Okay, that's my back to uh, the fertilizer. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the things that I have noticed is that when you have a lot of wood chips, maybe like four inches, you know, something like that, you, you've got a mulch and whatever's going on inside, and right now, um, it, this camera doesn't pick it up, but it is full, full of life inside of this. I mean, a lot of beetles, there's a lot of spiders, ants, <laughs> there's a lot of like uh, fungi, microorganisms. I can't see the microorganisms, I could see the fungi because it's like white filaments. But there's so much life inside of this that I I joke around sometimes and I say I don't put cow fertilizer I don't need cow cow dung I got beetle dung <laughs> you see because all of these all of these small little insects in here they're pooing you know and they die and their bodies are being eaten up by something else that that uh that also poos and also dies and the carcasses go in here and then the bacteria and the fungi all of that is just doing whatever it does and it just gets richer and richer and richer and so you so there is some insect manure <laughs> um so yeah i mean it's just that the things happen by themselves when you let them if you want to kill all the insects you won't have this going on then you uh then you're like oh well i need to bring in cow manure and then uh where do you get your cow manure you have cows okay you don't have cows well you're bringing it from the outside and who, and who knows what's in that manure you know and cows they're not treated properly most of them i mean and most cows are not really really real cows they're also been genetically enhanced okay they're not part of natural selection there are some cows that are closer to the natural ox uh, in India but I mean uh, that's not what people are putting in their gardens so anyways there you have it 27 minutes a little uh, discourse here on fertilizer 
and why you don't need it, okay? Break free from things that you've been told. You don't need to be repeating what other people are repeating who, who are basically learned it from someone who's just repeating something from a quote expert who basically is just doing what they were told. <sighs> okay, it's like direct experience and let everything go and just do try stuff and then uh, you will be amazed and surprised how much you could get away with and uh, how your reality shifts and how your consciousness expands along with uh, everything else that is going on in the garden okay so all right I keep saying this but in uh, uh, next video I'm going to make a, a full presentation of what sacred uh, what is sacred agriculture or at least the way I uh, practice sacred agriculture and um, yeah so no fertilizer no chemicals no animal input uh, no pesticides no herbicides and uh, very little water is needed and um, yeah, there you go. Take care, everybody.